Good evening, everyone. I am so excited that you all have joined us tonight. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Beth Holloway. I'm the Assistant Dean for Diversity and Engagement in the College of Engineering here at Purdue, and we are excited to be celebrating First Generation College Student Week this week. Um, in as part of that celebration, I have invited four amazing alums to come and talk to you tonight about their experiences. And um, first, I want to thank them very much for taking the time to talk with us this evening. Um, I know that they are located on um, all ends of the country, so it's at uh, some different times where they are. But thank you very much to our panelists. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna introduce them real briefly, and then I'm gonna let them talk about their experiences. So they each will say a few words um, about what they do, about their experiences in college, et cetera. Hopefully that will um, spark some questions from y'all. Um, and they are going to be really excited to answer. You can type your questions in either the chat box or the Q&A section tonight. Um, when you do that, I will read those out and, um, and then our panelists will answer. So um, without further ado, and when I say a brief introduction, I truly mean a brief introduction because I want them to tell you about themselves and what is important to them. So we have Bob, Ashley, Lauren, and Patrick. And I am just going to um, pick one to go first, and then we'll kind of roll from there. So hopefully y'all are ready. Ashley, you are already unmuted, so I am going to have you go first. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, everybody, for um, attending. So if you see me kind of like looking to the left, it's because one of the things I do is I talk too much, um, like I'm doing now, and so I just kind of prepared some stuff so I could hit the important things. Uh, but my name's Ashley Suarez. I'm originally from uh, Chicago, Illinois. I actually graduated in 2011 with a bachelor's in chemical engineering and a specialty in pharmaceutical engineering. And I'm not sure if they still do it, but it just allowed me to get classes uh, more practically in like pharmaceutical manufacturing. It's a little bit different than some other fields. And um, I got to actually take classes that uh, PharmDs took, so it was very interesting. Uh, so actually, when it comes to like kind of my background in college and, and getting where I am, uh, I have one older sister and she was the first person in my family to go to college or pursue secondary education. Um, and she went into photography. So I went in high school to an all girls uh, liberal arts high school. So our focus was like theater, English, uh, visual arts, um, science and math really weren't big. Uh, but luckily, my senior year, my physics teacher said, Hey, uh, you're good at math, you're good at science. What about engineering? I'm like, I have no clue what that is. Um, but so I kind of talked to him a little more and took a leap, right? into an engineering degree. And I'm really glad I had that guidance because otherwise I wouldn't be in a job I love so much. Um, so then kind of when I started at Purdue, I was this small fish in this big pond. I came from an all girls high school into the chemical engineering program. And I look around me and it seemed like everybody around me, aunts, uncles, dads, cousins, brothers, graduated from Purdue. They were engineers at Lilly, at Procter and Gamble, and I'm like, yeah, you know, just kind of, kind of nodding. And so I really was um, kind of a little meek and, and try my freshman year. But one of the big things that I ended up doing that really helped me a lot um, was getting involved in the women in engineering program. So my freshman year, I was lucky enough to be paired up with. Um, someone who was in one of those like lineages of Purdue grads and engineers and, and stuff like that. And it was great because she was down to earth and really helped give me tips and tricks to kind of succeed as an engineer because I had no clue that you had to go out and try to find an internship. I had no clue that, um, you know, I could go talk to a TA during office hours and learn things. So that was one really big thing, right, that I just wanted to make sure I touched on. Um, and it kind of helped me build confidence. And so while I was at 
uh, Purdue kind of just one other thing I want to hit on um, a big about maybe something I didn't know and learned uh, was, uh, you know, finances, right? So I didn't have people to coach me through how to pay for uh, my schooling, right? And so luckily my sophomore year, I was able to get a paid internship. It came with a scholarship, um, but that's just a really big thing that I wish I would have kind of known. Um, and and as opposed to some of the other students around me, right, uh, as being a first-gen student, my family couldn't really coach me on. Um, but so luckily, right, I ended up getting a paid internship and a scholarship with Merck, and that's where I still am today. So I, I've spent the last nine years with Merck in a bunch of different positions, um, but something that I really keyed into and realized I liked quickly was being where the action happens, so in manufacturing. So I've spent eight and a half years uh, working in packaging manufacturing. So I'm a chemi working in like mechanical and industrial engineering. Um, and so I just recently actually made the switch now to like a completely remote role. So I actually live in North Carolina. That's where our huge packaging hub is. Um, and now I'm doing like packaging design. Um, so I've taken a change from every day coming in, my job being different. So like one day I went to work and our whole company got shut down by a cyber attack and I had to figure out how to get like four packaging assets back up so that people could still get like cancer medicine um, to now uh, I'm actually designing packaging like we do the handoff from clinical trials to a manufacturing site so I'm actually working on an antiviral um, oral solid for uh, COVID so I, I guess now I'm more on, on the other side but so really kind of getting my feet in, right? Finding what I liked and then moving it into something different. But so now, right, that's kind of a quick journey, but after eight years, right, you can kind of see like a big city girl from Chicago. I now work out of like a small town, North Carolina uh, packaging site. So it's been a journey. And that was a little longer than I thought, but. <laughs> Great, thanks, Ashley. We appreciate the sharing of your story. So, um, Bob, I'm going to ask you to go next. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And I want to say, you know, I echo a lot of what Ashley, Ashley stated. And, you know, I'll start from my background. I, mean, I grew up in northwest Indiana, so pretty close to Chicago, but just east of the state line. And um, similar to her, it wasn't so much a, a teacher that led me down this path. I was filling out my application for Purdue, and my dad walked by and said, here math and science why don't you apply to the engineering school and then I got into the school of engineering and decided I liked it um and so kind of just hung with it but similar to what Ashley said you know one of the things you know when you come into Purdue and everyone else has parents or brothers and sisters and others that have gone to um when you don't have that factor it, it's important to grow your own network and figure out how to do that. You know, you know, I want to echo what Ashley said. I heard everybody talk about TA hours and professor hours, and I will fully admit I did not take advantage of that. Um, and I wish somebody would really just beat it into my head because uh, my first year was rough at Purdue. Um, you know, like most engineering students, I had fantastic grades in high school. I never studied. I never took a book home. Uh, I thought I could do that same thing. And I quickly, and, um, you know, and so then I had to teach myself how to study the rest of my freshman year and figured out sophomore year that I needed to find a group of friends to study with that were in all my classes and find people to lean on and learn from. And eventually my grades came up and ended up, um, you know, graduating. And I worked for the state of Indiana for a number of years. And uh, about eight years, I worked for the state of Indiana. And for the past 11 years, I've been working for h and Corporation. Um, and now I am currently the group director and water service practice leader. So I'm responsible for trying to grow our water services. So that's, you know, stormwater, drinking water, wastewater. And 
managing a group of about uh, 35 engineers. So to be honest, I don't do much real engineering work anymore. It's more trying to manage people and just make sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to and keeping our clients happy and developing relationships. So, you know, all those things that I kind of picked up in college on developing relationships have really served me well to keep sure, keep making sure that we're delivering and, and making sure our clients are happy and employees are happy and just kind of using all the well-rounded skills that I picked up at Purdue. Great. Thanks, Bob. And I will just add here that once an engineer, always an engineer. So you always need to call yourself an engineer, even if you're not doing calculation all day or whatever it is we think engineers do. You were trained as one and you are one. Okay. Um, Lauren, can you tell us a bit about your background yourself and what you do? Yeah. Hi. And uh, like Ashley, I also have notes. So um, you, you guys will see me looking over to the side because I want to make sure I cover everything. So uh, my name is Lauren Bacallier. I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana. I went to Perry Meridian High School for those of you that grew up in the Indianapolis area. And I graduated from Purdue with a degree in industrial engineering in 2005. Um, I started working at NASA down at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas right after that. So in January 2006 is when I started at NASA. And so I'm coming up on my 15 year anniversary, work anniversary of coming here in January. Um, you know, like the other panelists, I am the first person in my family to graduate from college, um, to ever attend a four year um, program at all. And so, you know, having a professional study or a professional degree was not something that was really on my radar growing up. It's just not something that I saw um, in my family or, you know, even in my neighborhood. But I got involved in the first robotics team um, in high school, and I was involved in that pretty much all through high school. And through that, we were mentored by Rolls Royce, and I met people for the first time who were engineers. And so that was like my first time being exposed to real life people who, who were engineers, and I could really understand what that would look like in everyday life. And so that's where people started talking to me about potentially pursuing that for college. Um, so one thing that I did that I think was kind of pivotal for me was going to engineering camp. So I don't know if Purdue still offers this, but back in the early 2000s, they did. And I went to, to engineering camp the summer before my senior year in high school. Uh, you got to stay in the dorms, you got to do projects, you know, meet other kids who were interested in engineering. And through that, I was exposed to the various labs and the types of things that engineers do and what it would look like to go to a four-year college. So that's, that's where I knew I wanted to go to Purdue. Um, I applied, I got accepted, and I had a, an excellent time there. I think some of the things that, that helped me be successful through my studies at Purdue is um, obviously the mentorship aspect. You know, Ashley talked about that a little bit. Mentorship, I cannot stress enough how important mentorship is at the university level and then even at the professional level. Um, I'm in management now. I've, you know, been, been a supervisor for many years. And one of the things that I, that I try to drive home with, with, you know, interns or even new employees or anybody really interviewing for a job at all is the idea of utilizing your resources and looking at what success looks like and trying to emulate that. Going and talking to people and asking them, hey, you're doing this thing. What are those skills that you have that got you there? And then look at your own, like have some self-awareness, look at your own projects, your own job, your own situation and then trying to develop those competencies but to me it's what does success look like through mentorship um, the other thing that I when I talk to students especially engineering students and this was something that I was able to to come to understand um, you know I I struggled early on I remember my first year it was it was tough and um, you know my my mom she's my cheerleader right but she didn't know what I was going through and how, and how um, 
you know, mentally taxing trying to get an engineering degree is. But I think the thing for me that I that I came to understand and that I provide to a lot of students now is the university is teaching you how to be a problem solver. And if the degree that you are earning, they're not giving it to you, you're earning it. If it's not worth something, then that's why it's hard, right? It's hard because it's worth something. And when places like NASA or pharmaceutical companies or whatever, when they're coming to Purdue and they're looking for engineers, they know that they're gonna get a quality engineer because that's what Purdue turns out. And so um, I think the point that I'm making is, yes, it's hard, but it's worth it um, because your investment is worth something in the long run. And that's that degree that you are earning. Uh, the other thing I wanna talk about is taking advantage of the support that the university offers through resume help, office hours, TA support. I had to do all of that. There is no way I would have gotten through with the grades that I did without falling back on that support. Um, support through the women in engineering program, through the mentors there, through my resident assistants. Again, what does success look like? What are these people doing that have, you know, unlocked the, the key to success and then trying to emulate that and learn from others, right? Um, that's something that, you know, I've also been able to bring into NASA and, and as, as a flight controller, so I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. As a flight controller, that's something we drive home in our new flight controllers is that idea of competency because the decisions that our flight controllers are making when they're in mission control can have ultimate consequences. And so, you know, utilizing their resources and studying and knowing their stuff is of utmost importance. So that's kind of taking you to what I'm doing now. Um, I started at NASA in 2006. I started as a shuttle flight controller. Um, I achieved many certifications before I got to what they call the front room. That's the room, if you turn on NASA TV, you're gonna see mission control on TV. Um, it may be shocking to you, but they don't put you there right out of college. You've got to work your way up into that room, learn lots of different things. And so I was a flight controller for shuttle um, for the last 21 space shuttle missions. And then I've since then gone into different management and supervisory positions. Today, I manage a team of about uh, 115 people. They are flight controllers across several different disciplines for the International Space Station across multiple countries because it is an international effort. And they primarily perform planning and integration functions for the International Space Station and then for commercial crew as well. And then also for Artemis, which will be launching in about a year. So that's the job that I have now. And um, I think those things, taking advantage of resources, mentorship, and then just sort of like toughness and competence is what I would say has made me successful and what I've seen, seen others do. I, it's been a while since we've caught up and th those are some pretty cool things that you've been working on. Patrick, can you tell us some things about what you're doing, where you came from, how you got there? Yeah, and I just wanna start off, I mean, the other three panelists really covered a lot of important points. So I'll try to skip over those and kind of tell you my experience. I know there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, and so I'll just kind of start at the beginning. About 10 years ago, I started my Purdue journey. Um, and like the other three, uh, I, I guess confident, you know, I got in Purdue engineering, really excited, um, kind of unbelievable experience. But once it hit and all the questions started coming, it was kind of overwhelming and lost in um, how to handle it, where, where to even start. You know, my parents, I, they didn't have the answers. Who my parents have always had the answers. I couldn't go to them and just get that answer right there. Um, and then, you know, even asking out friends, family, even asking the university, there was kind of a, a variety of different answers you would get and none of them are perfect. Um, and I, I think that was one of the big things I learned right away. Coming from high school, like Bob, you know, it was very straightforward, you know, I, I kind of easy, I would say. Um, and then college was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I think the one thing I learned at Purdue a lot was that you have to create your own answers. Um, there's no one there that's gonna give you that answer. There's no one that can give you that answer. And you, you have to take your foot forward and keep working towards it and create your own answers, create your own journey. Um, and that's kind of 
you know, my big takeaway from all this, um, but just a little, you know, history going in, I thought I was going to be an aerospace engineer, all this grand, grand thoughts got in and I realized, whoa, first year tough, um, probably not for me. I got um, paired up with a great, great um, advisor who guided me um, and kind of, you know, there's these options, take this seminar, kind of get a handle of what you like, what you want to do, what makes you happy. Um, and that really, really got me going. Um, Triple E was brand new environmental and ecological engineer then. I think I was one of like the first seven students and definitely one of the first undergrads um, or I guess under a junior in there. I think I was the first one. Um, and it was so that brought me into a mentorship with I had all these great upperclassmen direct contact with which I mean in a civil or something there's so many people it's really hard to get that contact. Um, so I got lucky in that aspect but to reiterate everyone else you know really reach out to your peers and get that connections um, and, and try to have them as your support group. Um, and that leads into the second part. Kind of, your support group is so important at Purdue, whether it's your parents or your friends, faculty, advisors, professors, there's everyone, you know, even the people you go to the bar with, it really doesn't matter. You need that support group there. Um, and, and really try to establish that as early as you can and be there for other people. Don't forget to reciprocate that. Um, and then while I was there, I think one of the biggest takeaways from the classes I took was Epics. Um, Epics is incredible. Uh, I, great people, it was tough. I, I hated it sometimes daily, you know, but um, I learned so much and there's so much I, I bring and use every day. Um, and then my wife was in Epics too. And we both talk about those, the skills we learned, you know, daily or we bring them into clubs or different things, you know, different committees we're on now, which is awesome to have that experience. Um, and then while I was there, I kind of took a, a different route than I would say a lot of people do. I found my internship at school. Um, I worked for the Office of University Sustainability for almost two and a half years there. Um, and that kind of is what I used for my professional experience. Um, and it, it was amazing. I got to really branch out into what I like to do, which is sustainability work. But also I got to have real world problems. I would go from one class and then go to that internship the same day and I'd be working on the same things. So I could really tie together um, you know, those, those subjects. And it's awesome to have that opportunity at Purdue. And that is like what I want to drive home as much as possible. You guys have so many resources at that school that don't let them go to waste. Like everyone was saying, you know, whether it's a TA, office hours, resume help, or internship, any of that, like they're at your fingertips, use them. And uh, yeah, I, and then I guess now um, I, right out of school, I got an internship with the Department of Energy, working on energy policy, which um, personally makes me happy. I love doing it, um, but there's this part of me, this engineer part of me coming out of school that was like, I need, I wanna get my PE, I wanna do this traditional role and I, I wanna build these skill sets. So after that internship, I came out to California and I'm working for a general in engineering contractor, um, doing mostly civil work, but civil structural um, and little environmental work. Um, so what we do is we take public and private jobs and we build them. Um, I'm actually on construction sites daily and managing the crews and budgets and all that. Um, so it's really fun to see the design come and you build a road, you know, it, it's really cool bringing all that out and actually seeing it, you know, everyone's kind of touched on that, seeing those products and having your hands on something that's happening. Um, and it's so great about engineering. Um, so right now I'm studying for my PE. I'll be taking in January, fingers crossed. Um, and then hopefully maybe getting back into energy policy or something a little more passionate, so. Um, and I know that you're gonna be successful when you take your PE because you are a Purdue engineer. So there you go. You know, Lauren mentioned when she was talking that she met, for the first time, she met engineers when she was in high school. And that got me to thinking, when was the first time I actually met a real live engineer? And it was not until I went to college. So um, I'll share that I identify as a first-gen student myself. And um, I knew so little about engineering that I didn't know that women weren't supposed to do that. So I guess that was a good thing <laughs> that uh, I had no clue that um, women weren't supposed to be engineers. I just thought that was normal because you know I wanted to do it. But anyway, this is not about me. So we have a question uh, and this would be a good one. I think a great one for Patrick, but I think maybe everyone might want to weigh in on this one. 
do you suggest taking the FE exam and getting your PE as soon as possible once out of college? So FE, I would highly recommend doing it your senior year or right out of college. Uh, most of that information is going to be what you learned in your classes and just being able to knock that one out. It, it wasn't too bad. It's more of just getting into the habit of learning how that exam is set up and how to study, how to be ready for those questions. Um, the resources are there. They, they kind of guide you along. Um, PE is a whole other, I think it depends on what PE you're going to get. Um, for environmental, you can possibly do it more out of school. For a civil, you kind of need the experience that um, some of the questions are directly related to professional development that you're not going to be able to get from just classes. You're going to need a little bit of experience. But I know they're transitioning the PE that you can take it after you pass your FB, you can take your PE whenever, the actual exam. You won't get your stamp until after you have the amount of experience. So. And, and Patrick, I'm over here. I, I had to Google FE because I forgot what it meant. Um, <laughs> but I, that was one thing in my notes, though, that I wanted to maybe just express. So know the field that you're getting into, um, because right now in my career, right, at nine years, I've been able to go through like three promotions um, and get to a point where, right, um, an FE or, or a PE isn't going to buy me much. It's going to be more about my skill set. Um, and that's really because of the, the career path I've taken um, and, and just the group I'm in, right? So I have an engineering background. I went into manufacturing. I loved being a part of that. Um, and where I am, right, it's not, not necessarily required. Um, and if I did it, I wouldn't be passionate about it. So I wouldn't do well at it. Um, and that's like one piece of advice I got from a mentor at work that I thought was great. Like, why are you doing it? Know your role, know what you need to excel at, because if there's no passion behind it and there's no reason for you really to get it, um, it you don't need to check a box, right? So, yeah. And I, I literally, I have Google up like F-E-P-E, -E, what, <laughs> what am I forgetting? So Ashley, I'll share with you. I have been graduated for so long that when I graduated, it was not the F-E. Um, it was actually called the EIT exam, engineer in training. Um, and I took it because a professor told me to. And I said, I don't think I'm going to need it. And he said, you don't know that. Take the test now because you can. You'll forget everything <laughs> that you need for that fundamental exam. Take it now and then you will have it. So I took it, um, but I never did take the PE exam. Bob, do you have something to add? Well, I was going to echo, you're not the only one that took the EIT. <laughs> um, so um, don't, don't, feel, don't feel too bad. But similar to what you said, it was, and I'll, and I'll also admit, I didn't realize the importance of it, um, similar to Patrick. And, and I think I forgot to mention, I graduated with an agricultural and biological engineering degree and have kind of matriculated to civil engineering more so than, than what one would expect from a typical typical ag engineer. Um, but I didn't realize the importance of the FE or PE until um, it was almost too late. Because when, when I took it and Beth took it and until a few years ago, um, it was only offered in the spring of your senior year. And that Saturday was always Grand Prix at Purdue. And <laughs> I had some friends that we're trying to talk me into, you know, just um, enjoying my, our last Grand Prix weekend. And the only thing that really kept me from doing that was I think, I'm trying to remember it was a few years ago, but I think as long as you took the test in, in ABE, it was paid for by the school. But if you signed up for it and didn't pay, you had to reimburse them the $50 or what, whatever the cost was. It, it wasn't a significant cost unless you're in college and you have no money. Um, and so the only thing that really saved me was the fact that I was going to have to figure out how to come up with $50 to repay the ag and bioengineering school, um, the cost of my FE. And then, you know, looking back on it now in my career and, you know, I'm, I'm licensed in several states. Um, and, you know, it, if I would have made that mistake, I don't know where my career would have actually taken me. And so it's, it's, I wouldn't, strongly suggest if you're going into one of the fields like civil or where you're going to look to be doing something, yes, take the FE uh, as soon as possible. And similar to what Patrick said, depending on what branch you want to take, the PE can wait a couple of years and you can learn as you go. But the FE is uh, 
take it while you're in college. Um, I've heard many stories from folks of who've tried to take it a couple of years after college and they regretted that decision. So I won't even try. <laughs> <laughs> so the FE exam is now a computerized exam and you can schedule it uh, whenever it fits best in your schedule in your last semester of college um, would be the earliest you can take it. Um, I was a December grad, so uh, my date was on Halloween. So that was also a fun thing. But now well, you can take now it COVID, we are in a global pandemic, right? So you're not gonna you're not gonna be wanting to leave the house. <laughs> I mean, this year would have been great, only um, yeah. you do have to take it at a testing site, and many of those have not always been open through the pandemic, so it's um, a little bit hard. Um, there is a question, so Purdue assists in paying for the FE, question mark. Um, I will say that some of the, um, the engineering departments will assist, some will not. Um, so this is a great question to ask your advisor. Does Purdue offer us in my in this department? Does do you offer assistance to help pay for the FE? Um, and unfortunately, Bob, it's a lot more than fifty bucks <laughs> nowadays. Um, they changed the name, and it also went up a little bit in price. So um, inflation and all of that. Okay, so we have another question. Um, how important do you think joining an honor, honor society on campus is? Um, this is an interesting question. Um, I'm not qualified to answer that because I never qualified for an honor society on campus when I was an undergrad. But um, you know, maybe some of our panelists would care to take that question. I think I can address that. So um, for a number of years, I've as as part of NASA, I have been doing interviews for our Pathways program, which is just another name of for our co-op program. And um, it's a pretty competitive program. Um, the students that, that get selected for an interview, it's pretty hard to get an interview. And then even after that, it's pretty tough to get a spot. Um, the reason being is because when the students end up serving their you know full co-op tours, it's usually three tours, they're you know, 99% guaranteed a placement after that. And it's, um, you know, as a federal serv civil servant, which is also another kind of tough thing to get. So um, anyway, all that in saying, I interview students for that. And the way I would, I would address this question is just based on what I'm looking for in interviews. Um, all the students are smart. They're all smart. They all have great, good grades. Um, that is not a defining factor for who I want to hire. Who I want to hire is someone who has used their experience. And I see there's another question in here about clubs, courses, research, you know, internships. I want to see a student who's used their experience, whatever that is, to demonstrate teamwork, that they can play well with others, that they can solve hard problems and have independent thoughts. Those are the kinds of things that I'm looking when I interview a student. So a, a resume with I've done A through Z means nothing to me. It's a student who can speak about those things in a tangible way and show me that they've leveraged the honor society, the club, the internship, whatever it is to be a valuable contributor into the workplace. And, and the, the kinds of things Literally, if you just Googled what are interview questions, it's all those things. It's tell me about being part of a team. Tell me about having to, to come up with the creative solution. Tell me about working through a conflict with another person. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. So I would just say not focusing on too much about like the specific thing, the club, the honor society, the research, the internship, but what are you learning out of that? And then what can you then bring with you into the workplace? That's what I care about. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, and I, yeah, and Lauren, I think that, that I echo that. So I was in an honor society. <laughs> I was in the chemical engineering honor society my junior and senior year, but I'd say it was just, it was what I made of it. So I got to lead this like chemi kids day. And, you know, when I went into interviews to Lauren's point, I listed the honor society I was in because I had such a great story to tell about it. So um, 
it is something, and it's the same, what Lauren said, the same advice I give people with their resumes or what, what they're looking to join. Um, find something you're passionate about so you can get a really good experience. Like I think Patrick probably has some good ones in Epic. That's another really big one. I would say like, it's not an honor society, but it's something that is a really good experience. Like I did it for one semester um, because that's all I could fit, but it was, it was great. Yeah, and it's a tangible experience, right? It's like a project that you're working on with a team that you have something to show for at the end. So I think that's another bonus for, for an interview or for, you know, a career. We have um, a question in the Q&A. Um, I'd love to hear about all the resources Purdue offers. As a transfer student during the pandemic, I am struggling to uncover a lot of these. I can imagine why it's much more difficult um, these days than it typically is. Um, a few topics I'd love to hear more about, how to be involved in the Women in Engineering program, can I explore internships around the West Lafayette area, or should I automatically broaden my scope? And what was the top resource you utilized at Purdue if you haven't already addressed it? I can, I can start with the broadening your scope, and it partially depends on what you want to do. I mean, obviously, I'm not qualified to talk about the women in engineering and can't relate to that one at all. But I mean, you know, there, there's, there's opportunities in the West Lafayette area, but if you're going to only want to focus in that area, your options are going to be extremely limited. So, um, you know, I grew up, like I said, in Northwest Indiana and made it to Purdue and then had an internship in, 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 in Indianapolis and haven't really left since then. Um, but that internship came through talking with my faculty advisor and just talking to him about jobs and where, where the potential existed um, and not trying to limit my focus in understanding the fact that, you know, to get a job after school, an internship was really important. Um, I had preferred, you know, I preferred trying to stay close to West Lafayette just because my family was up close to Chicago and Indianapolis isn't too much farther away. But as time grew on, I said, I don't really care where it is. As long as I can find some sort of a job, I'll, I'll go wherever I can, as long as my car will get me there. Um, so, I mean, you know, it, it's partially in what you want to make of it. And if there's something ultra specific, your options are going to be fairly limited. But, um, you know, if you're willing to travel, your your options will be much more abundant. Thanks, Bob. I think that that is great advice. You certainly can try to target a particular geographical location, whether it's West Lafayette or somewhere else in general. Um, but you might have more limited options than if you are open to um, a broader area. Um, as far as um, being involved in the Women in Engineering program, I would highly suggest that you just send me an email directly and I'll get you hooked up. So um, what I didn't mention is that in addition to being Assistant Dean for Diversity and Engagement, I am the Director of the Women in Engineering program. Um, this is how I know Ashley and Lauren. Um, I've gotten to know Bob and Patrick through this process, but um, yeah, my email is super easy, holloway at purdue.edu. Send me an email, we'll get you connected, it'd be great. Um, in terms of a top resource that you utilized when you were at Purdue, so maybe each of you could say, like, if you could, if you had to pick just one thing, what was it? Okay, I would what say, is supposed to be a stumper I, question? yeah, I would say for me, it was the um, help rooms. That's a I would one. not have passed any of the physics without the help rooms, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, and so the number one, when she says just, when Beth says just email her, she means it, like she will get back to you. <laughs> um, I, I think for me, yeah, it was um, like office hours, they're just smaller than, than big lecture halls and that's, uh, it was easier for me to digest. I was so, so overwhelmed in some of the big classes. Lauren said, help room. So this is, um, many of the departments have these. Um, so physics has one, math has one, chemistry has one. 
Um, a lot of the courses in the ME department have them. Um, these are rooms that you can, well, in a normal semester, not a pandemic semester, in a normal semester, they are open during certain hours, typically all day long, and you can just pop in there and they are staffed with somebody who can help you. So the physics help room, as an example, um, that's been around for quite some time because Lauren used it, but I did too, a longer, longer time ago. Um, and, you know, I had questions about my homework, right? I would go in and I would say, I tried to, <laughs> I started this problem and I got stuck. Can y'all help me? Or, you know, I was studying for an exam and there was a concept that I totally didn't get. You go into the help room and, you know, they can get you hooked up. Uh, a lab, right? You have to do your, your after lab report and you, you get stuck in a certain section, right? They can help you get unstuck. So they can help um, with both broad concepts and specific issues, both. Um, it's a little bit different than office hours, right? Because office hours are typically for a particular professor or a particular TA um, with a particular course. Um, so a help room is sort of like a tutoring center for that particular subject. Hopefully that helps. Um, the only thing I can say about physics is um, if you have trouble telling your right hand from your left hand, be extra careful when you need to implement the right hand rule. So this is why I got a C in physics. Okay, how has being or has being a first generation college graduate caused you any major hardships that you've had to overcome in postgraduate professional life and how did you overcome them? So I, one of the things that caused me a lot of hardships was the first role I took out of college was um, very like technical. It was in developing um, right our medicine. So it was working on stuff that was in the pipeline, right? Everybody around me was similar to like the people in college that overwhelmed me. Um, and so I, I got into my career and I was like, oh my gosh, like this is what it, being an engineer is and I'm never going to be able to do it. Um, I don't know what the rest of the folks on this call is like, but my family was like a, a blue collar worker. So trade workers, everything. And, and that's who I related to. I couldn't relate to um, folks at that level. Uh, but so what I did was, and luckily I was in a rotational program. Um, I, I took a role like way outside of that space in like manufacturing and I ended up um, being better able to connect with my like fellow employees when I found a, a job and a role that was more similar to like what the people I had grown up with. And so um, I would say for me, like overcoming that hating, like this, the environment I worked in was, was really trying to find mentors and thinking about other positions that that you could work. So maybe it doesn't always have to be the most technical engineering job that you go into, right? You can be putting on safety shoes every day and walk into a production floor. I think this would be a good time to talk about imposter syndrome. Um, I didn't know that that's what this was called when I was in school, but I certainly had it. Um, I remember walking into, you know, huge lecture hall the first day and, you know, I had just gotten the computer for the first time. I did not grow up with the computer in my home. Um, I learned to type on a typewriter and my dad had gotten me a computer to go to college and I knew nothing. I didn't know how to save a file. I didn't know how to search the internet. I knew nothing. And I'm going in in this class where this is this is years ago, guys, right? But it's, you know, it's computer programming. It's like the entry level computer programming. And, you know, all of these these other kids, I call them kids, it's like they all seem to know what was going on. And I was like, this is literally a foreign language. I I have I didn't even know this existed. And that was kind of the start of, I do not belong here. I do not deserve to be here. And, you know, throughout my, my college career, I just had this, I need to work harder than everybody else. And I did. 
and I made better grades than everybody else too, but I attributed it to the fact that I just worked my butt off. And so then I got in, I got to NASA and, um, you know, you're kind of in the same environment as a flight controller. It's like, you're, you're tested and you're tried and you, um, I mean, they don't want you to kill anybody and your actions can kill people. And so it is not, um, for somebody who is thin skinned. Um, I mean, people in flight control training, like you're going to get yelled at, you're going to get, you know, told when you make a mistake in no uncertain terms. And so, um, you know, I kind of went through the whole, the same thing again. It's like, okay, I have to study. I have to work harder than everybody else. And it wasn't until I was in my last position. And so this is like 10 plus years into my career where I had a boss who I would say he gave me some stretch assignments. He, he's like, Lauren, I want you to go do this. And I'm like, really me now you want me to go do that and he's like yeah you can do it you're smart and it's he pushed me to my limit and it wasn't until that happened that it that it feels like that imposter syndrome went away um now I'm in a role that there is no there is no room for that it's like I have to make hard decisions every day am I responsible for a lot of people and a lot of work Um, I don't struggle with that anymore, but it took many years into my career to like, let that go. Um, I think it's just, I guess the advice that I'd have for anybody that's dealing with that is just one, it's normal. And then two, maybe because of your experiences, you do have to work harder to overcome some things, but it's not because you're not smart and you don't deserve to be there at Purdue, at NASA, wherever it's maybe just because you didn't have the things that the other kids had growing up. And that doesn't mean you're any less of a person. It just means you have to work to overcome some of those things because you didn't get, you didn't start ahead of the game. Right. So that's, that's the, the advice that I'd give. Add to that um, for everything that you have as a challenge, you also have a strength. Um, You know, and Ashley kind of referred to this a little bit growing up with a blue collar family and uh, family friends. And that was my experience too. And it turns out I was really, really great at working with technicians, like super awesome. That was a strength that I had. And so, you know, there are things that are part of your background Um, that you can use as strengths to build um, on your career and build on your success. So, so I wouldn't always, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm going to challenge everyone who's on the call to not just think about the challenges you have, but think about the assets that you bring because of your background. So don't think about what you need to do in spite of your background. Think about what you have because of your background. So that's maybe a, a, interesting thing to think about for you all. Who has been been your biggest mentors throughout both academia and your personal life? And how did you find them? I'm going to add that. How did you find your mentors? For me, I've always found that informal mentorships work best. So there are mentor programs, um, you know, everywhere you go. To me, I observe, again, what does success look like? And that's the relationship that I start to form. And so, um, you know, I think at the, if if someone were to ask someone who's my mentor, hey, are you, you, you Lauren's mentor? They'd be like, yeah, I guess I am. But I mean, we've never really used that word before. And so for me, that's just been a more successful, it's a relationship. It's not a title. And through the relationship is where you you bring things to them, right? So I with I meet with several of my mentors monthly, and I'll think about it as I go through the month. Okay, what are the kinds of things that this person is involved in that maybe I can bring them a different perspective that they could be exposed to, or maybe I could bring them into some challenges that I'm having at my level that they could help me with because they've been there too. So. My point is use the relationships intentionally 
and think of it as a relationship, a two-way street instead of a title. Um, some of my most like biggest mentors. Okay, so I had a, a women in engineering mentor named Adrian, and this was in the. Um, I'm sure I'm calling it the wrong thing, but it's it's when you're a freshman and you are paired up in, a, in like a kind of a small class, like small group setting with an upperclassman. And they're talking to you about things like, you know, resume prep and how to do a job fair and the differences between like all the different engineering disciplines. Adrian was the coolest and I had looked up to her a lot, um, but she was very significant in my life because she also studied industrial engineering. Um, and like like a story I heard earlier, I also came to Purdue to be an aeronautical engineer and then realized it was not my cup of tea and during my freshman year. And so learning to find to learning to find out, oh, there's something called industrial engineering and this is what it is was a huge eye opener for me. So that was a that was um an important mentor I had. Um another important mentor is um I, that I've had for many, 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 many years, 10 plus years, is a woman named Ginger Carrick, who was a flight director at NASA. And she started mentoring me when she was still going through her certification process. And I was for, as flight director, and I was going through my certification process to be a, um, you know, front room flight controller, as you call it. Um, but in that we were able to work together and we were learning our own independent thing together. And we've maintained that relationship throughout the years. She ended up being my supervisor like one position ago before I just got this promotion. Um, but using her, you know, sort of using her again as a relationship. She also made my wedding cake too, which is cool. Um, it's, it's really a relationship. That's the thing that I want to stress is it's not, it doesn't have to be a formal thing. I find mostly informals tends to be best for me. I always struggle with this question because I kind of what Lauren said, I, I don't think I have any, some I, they're like mentors. I, I don't know what that is. I have a lot of great relationships with peers, with people that are, you know, older doing what I want to do kind of things like that. I mean, even I would call my, my mom um, a mentor in some ways, you know, there, there's so many people in your life that you would look up to and you learn from and you learn your strengths and, and you gain something and you give something to. And um, I, I just, you know, it's all about building really solid relationships and, and being involved in other people's lives. I was going to say, just being like a little tactical, right? When someone's doing a presentation at work, because a lot of the times if you're at a larger company and they say, you know, I'd love to meet with you after if you're interested, if they interest you, meet with them, right? And follow up and talk to them. Um, you know, that's just how I operate. And, and it's what's given me a couple opportunities that I wouldn't have had other ways. So I make sure I follow up if they say like, you really want to hear it. They'll get an email from me after like, hey, thanks for this presentation, but let's talk. And every wholeheartedly, what everyone else has said is it's a two-way street. Um, you know, it's on you're you're learn a mentor is learning as much he, even if it's not um you know as, as i've progressed through my career i've become more of the mentor than the mentee but i'm learning just as much from those folks that are asking me questions and trying to do different things as they're learning from me so it's definitely a two-way street and don't be afraid to ask don't be afraid to ask your senior leaders once you get out of school questions um, you know, what I try to tell our new grads and co-ops and folk, things like that, you know, it's, I like to talk to you guys just as much as you want to talk to people that are your age. You know, I, I like to watch football. I like to watch basketball. Um, you know, and, you know, you know, we're all people, um, no matter what position you attain in life, you know, we all have some aspect that we'd like to relate to other folk, other people and want to have those personal relationships, no matter where you end up. And granted, it might not always be the best time to talk about, you know, the Colts game or, you know, whatever basketball game it was, but, you know, there's no harm in trying to come and talk to me. I, I like to spend time talking about things outside of work and, you know, growing as a person. And so it's, it's, don't be afraid to approach those people that you want to learn from. Um, most of us or most people are happy to take the time 
to grow because ultimately if you're in a company um, with that person, it's to everybody's benefit for everybody to keep moving along and growing. And, you know, whether it's, you know, whether it's a private company or a governmental agency, you know, it benefits everyone when everybody advances. Just another thing to build on what Bob said, all of us, got to where we are now because we had mentors, because we had people who were willing to um, coach us, who were willing to sponsor us, who were willing to write us a recommendation letter, tell someone else that we were really great, something along those lines. And because we all have that in our lives, most of us want to be that for somebody too, right? Because we know that to get to um, success, however you define success, you have people who help you along. And so, you know, don't be afraid to talk to people about what they're doing or ask their opinion or ask for more information about a really cool thing that you're interested in, right? Because, you know, they had that in their life too, in their professional career. Okay, so we have two minutes left. And real quick, what is one last thing that each of you want to say to our students on the call? What would you say to some fellow first geners? Have so much fun there. Purdue is such a great place. There's so many experiences, like things, you, it's endless out there. I mean, there's so many, there's research, there's extracurriculars or sports there's just so much you can do there and have fun um, relish every experience you have yeah don't leave no. <laughs> uh, stay in college the real world no um but so i would say like i think in lauren used the term imposter syndrome um find something that lets helps you overcome it right so for me it was that like i the game of life like that's when I first saw like the term engineer and they made a lot of money. And so I was like, let me do this. And then everyone else was like, Oh, I do this. Okay. Um, but then once I found that one thing that made me more confident, I just, you know, you kind of, kind of go from there. So if you're not doing everything, that's fine. You don't need to be, um, but, but do something meaningful while you're there. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, I think as engineers in one of, in, in engineering students, a lot of us think we have to know all the answers. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help. Like, um, you know, I knew there were help rooms and TA hours and I made my life entirely more difficult than it needed to be by not taking advantage of those. Um, so I would encourage everybody to take advantage of those and ask for help. No one, no one's going to look down on you for that. I would just say your future is bright. If you are willing to put in the work um, to achieve the degree, to earn the degree, um, what you have is very valuable. What you will have is very valuable, and it'll be something that you get to have for the rest of your life. It sounds like the, all the panelists aren't doing exactly what we studied in college now. That's normal. Um, I am not frequently pulling out my engineering books or my graphing calculator on a regular basis, but I am solving hard problems. And I am, you know, I feel contributing to something that's way bigger than myself, right? This international team um, that's doing human exploration. And so, and I would have never had that opportunity in others that are doing this with me alongside me they're all engineers too. And so it's a, it's an elite thing to achieve. Um, and it's something that's very valuable to bring with you for the rest of your life. Well, just to close things out, I want to thank you all once again, Bob, Ashley, Lauren, Patrick, thank you for spending the time with us this evening. Um, your advice has been really helpful. I know I got an email from a couple of students saying, I really wanted to come, but I had X or Y or Z going on. Are you going to record this? So um, we will be posting the recording somewhere once we figure out a good place to put that um, so that others can learn from your advice and your sharing. So thank you all very much. Um, for all the students out there, 
feel free to send me an email if you have follow-up questions, um, other things. I am happy to help. Um, I really do mean it, and I really will answer all of you. So thanks to everyone for attending. Have a great rest of your evening, and um, boiler up.